For some time, people have been predicting the end of print. No more books, no more newspapers. There was even a television program predicting just that. You remember Goodbye Gutenberg. Well, I wonder if I'm really going to be reading my local paper off a TV screen. Are computers really going to become the new media? For the pioneers of the West who came from the cities to these hills in search of gold, life was rough, tough, and dangerous. Once a month, if you were lucky, the mail would arrive by mule train, a journey of 53 days. By 1858, the stagecoach had penetrated deep into the West, and it had cut the time for the 2,700-mile journey from San Francisco to St. Louis to a mere 23 days. 23 days that were described by the passengers as hell on wheels. But for special messages, there was a faster way. The news of Abraham Lincoln's election in 1860 was sent by Pony Express, a distance of 2,000 miles in a mere six and a half days. But the era of the Pony Express was only to last 18 months, before it too was replaced by a device that revolutionized communications. And the principles of that device have hardly changed over the last 150 years. The connection to Salt Lake City is late. Can you telegraph ahead and find out what's gone wrong? Obviously, a man of few words. But he does know the code that allow me to send a message at the speed of light to anywhere connected to the end of that wire. It's a fairly simple code, no more than a series of ons and offs. And it doesn't really matter what it is, as long as the guy at the other end understands it, and he can send a message back in the same code. Da, did, did, da, da, did, did, da, da, da. That means, did, did. you dummy, stage attack by Indians. Next one do Tuesday week. Tuesday? Da, 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 da. Indians? I wonder if I got that right. Da, da, di, da, da, di, di, da, di, 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 da. Well, today, Mac could simply have made a phone call. There are still many kinds of message which we'd obviously rather send in the form of the written word. Letters can take a long time, although not quite as long as in the American West. And telegrams depend on knowing exactly where the other person is going to be and sending it there. What we often need is the instant letter, which can reach somebody no matter where they are. And that's just what electronics now makes possible. This is Prestel, and we're connected just by a perfectly ordinary telephone line to the Prestel computer. And as soon as we dial it up and get the Prestel display on our screen, it's nice and friendly, welcome to Prestel, and immediately new messages for you, key star 930, and that funny noughts and crosses sign, which is a hash, so let's do it. Star 930 hash, and what do we get? It's to the computer program, that's us, message, at Buffalo Creek, stage attack by Indians, will get there when I can. And it's signed Mac. So let's key one to store it away. And now we can send a message to Mac. So we just have to dial up, if we're regular users, we know how to do it, dial up star 934 hash, 
and we'll get a kind of message blank on the screen, which we can then fill in. OK, so we have to type in the recipient's account number, where we'll send it to Mac at the BBC's own personal Prestel number. So let's say 0199919. O oh, two and a hash, and it's to Mac. It recognises his number, so it'll get onto a Prestel machine wherever he is, and we send the message. What should we say to Mac? Good luck, Mac, and we'll sign it, Chris, and press the hash button. And here we are, the most kind message to the sender, key one to send, two to cancel. So we key one. Now, that's only the tip of the iceberg. Clear, hash, three, hash. The same terminal that will connect you with British Telecom's Prestel will also get you the North Hertfordshire District Council's computer, believe it or not because at the same time as calculating the rates and the council payroll, the same computer will also let you book a squash court or tell you what's happening at your local leisure centre. And you simply have to type in your user number, which in this case is 200 hash, and up comes quick as a flash from the North Hertfordshire District Council. Activities in the facilities, bookings, forthcomings, attractions, locations, membership, and so on. All I have to do is key one of those numbers to get the facility I want. But computers have now gone beyond helping people communicate. They'll even talk to each other without any help from people at all. Here's Jill Neville. Train timetables are often regarded as a bit of a joke, some people believing they're mere works of fiction. But there's nothing fictitious about the master timetable system installed by British Rail at Waterloo. Nor is there any question of the ability of this computerised system to cope with the arrival or departure of a train every 30 seconds during peak hours and 180,000 passengers a day. Every day, the timetables loaded into this computer as a reference, so that what actually happens and whether people really arrived on time can be analysed and compared with what should have happened. The comparison is made by the computers themselves without any human intervention. What happens is this. Each train has a scheduled running time and a stopping pattern. At various points along the track, its progress is automatically monitored and passed to this computer. When the train arrives at its destination, its record is examined and passed to the other computer to establish if it varied from its planned performance on the timetable. The train reporting system operates on an exception basis. That is, if the train's on time, the information is ignored by the computer. But if there's a deviation of more than a minute either way, the record of its performance is printed out for examination by the Divisional Control Office. If you like, it's a sort of dialogue between the computers. How's the 11.15? It's a bit late up there, but keep your eye on it, will you? Two minutes supposed to get in. 11.40? Hmm. Seems There's to be some, some problem, problem at Clapham Junction. Obviously, Mac, when people talk to each other and communicate with each other, they use words and languages. And I guess that when computers are talking to each other or within themselves, they're not really using words and languages as we understand them. No, they're not. They're communicating with electrical patterns, if you like. And this is a small mainframe computer which will be sending down data, characters, information, and control symbols to its storage unit, here its disk storage unit, and that will be sending information back. It'll be sending it to this magnetic tape, and that'll be sending it back. And, of course, it'll be receiving messages from this control console or a terminal and, again, sending messages back. And you can attach up to 200 of these terminals yeah. onto this sort of a system. And uh, we have another one here. Which this terminal use. is connected with that computer? Yes. Is there any limit to the distance that can be away? No, no limit at all, to, uh, providing you use the telephone that way. Right. And I think we can see this very clearly in here. You can send it... If you remember, the information is stored in eight ons and offs, or a byte. Right. And the keyboard here communicates with the actual computer itself yeah. through this 
band of wires. But effectively, it's sent in parallel, eight at a time, into the computer. Now, you can't do that over a telephone line. If that was in New York, you'd have to send them one after another. But you can think of them rather like soldiers marching down those telephone lines. It doesn't require much imagination to see what the possibilities of this method of communication could be. This is British Aerospace's new Airbus, the 146. Its wiring systems have been developed, checked or modified throughout the design and construction stages by programmers working from their own homes. They're employed by F International, a computer systems company who supplies software to industry. An employee is supplied with a terminal connected via the telephone to the computer in Hatfield. Once the telephone link's been established and the programmer has logged on by giving her password, programs can be run automatically. What's more, new ones can be written, mistakes from the previous day's work corrected and the results stored on disk. It was the flexibility of the work that appealed to Leslie Smith. She could work from home in her own time and still fetch the children from school or go shopping without being tied to an office or office hours. When her programs are on the disc, they can be printed out on the line printer ready for checking by the plane's designers before becoming part of the wiring specifications and sent out onto the factory floor. All Leslie's programming was going backwards and forwards down an ordinary telephone line. Now that's quite a thought because it opens up all sorts of possibilities. You may not think the average householder would have much need to access a database, but here's a database that everyone wants to access from time to time. It's a telephone directory. Now in France, the post office wants to put the telephone directories for the whole country onto a computer and have a terminal in every home and office. Now, like the printed telephone directories, it'll be supplied free. Now the first stage is already in use in parts of France and we are at this moment connected to it. Now we've dialed through and we've got a summary which gives you the facility. It's even got an English language version and a Spanish language version. Well this, the English language one is number three so let's press three and send and see what we get. Here we are. List of services. Let's go for the name first and see what choices they offer us. As with a lot of computers, you get a sort of multiple choice thing. You just have to press a number. Now, here we are, a little form to fill in. Name. We're going to look up and Monsieur Martin as an example. There we are. Martin is typed in. Press next. And it's received it. For persons, do not indicate the first name, but only the name. But it wants to know the locality. It's asking you to put in the name of a place. So let's put in Ren. Suppose I don't know how to spell Ren. I shall just put R-E-N and send and it even corrects my spelling r-e-double-n-e-s is how it should be spelt now there is at least 30 answers <laughs> the french directory says we don't want all 30 of them let's see if we can narrow it down a little bit so let's put in an initial his first name begins with s so s and send and up should come the directory and there we are there are three s martin serge martin simon S. Martin, and so on. Now, in Germany, if you want to do your shopping or even pay all your bills instantly from home, 
Build Sham Text gives you that facility. If you know the telephone number, you can even reach it from here with an ordinary Prestel adapter, which is what we've done. Now, we've gone through the Build Sham Text network at this very moment, and now we're directly connected to the computer of a large German bank. And this is what an instant electronic bank statement looks like. Now, if we want to pay a bill, we just go to the appropriate page. And there it is. We can fill in the details of who we want to send the money to, his bank code number, the postal code of the bank, and so on and so on. You can even fill in a little box here which says what the money is for. And here, of course, is the amount, Deutschmarks and Phoenix. But you don't have to be German. In a few months' time, a similar facility will be available from one of the big four British banks on Prestel. Well, for those of us who work in offices, and that, believe it or not, is about 40% of the working population, these new electronic systems could mean very, very big changes. Well, let's take a look at a typical office of today. Now, what are the first things you see, apart from the man working in it? It's the filing cabinets. Now, what's going to happen to them, Mac? Well, most of them are going to go, Chris, along with the invoices and bills. Those are all going to be sent through by the computer. What about our old office friend, the faithful typewriter? Are we going to say goodbye to that as well? <laughs> well, they're allowed to be replaced today by word processing equipment, and that's going to be enhanced with graphic output, with being able to connect it to the mainframe computer. So a secretary's job will really be enhanced as she's able to help her boss in understanding the sort of speed at which his business is changing. Does that mean you're going to do away with paper altogether? Are the stationary doors finally going to close? No, they're not, because people really do still like to read things on paper and not on screens. But there is one remorseless fact that's happening. The cost of telecommunications are going down by 15% of the year, and the cost of delivering paper is going up by a similar amount. So shipping vast amounts of data around on paper is just going to disappear. So as you said, there is going to be paper, there's going to be a demand for paper, but an awful lot less much, of much it. Much, much less of it. All right, well, come right. with me a second, Mac. I want to show you something. This is a sort of uh, a computer program speculative view, possibly, of the office <laughs> of the future. Um, we've got our computer terminal there. We've got our uh, view data terminal here. And we've got, as you described it, the word processor with its printer connected to it. Now, is that the sort of layout of a future office as you see it? Well, not a layout. There'll still be a filing cabinet, so some of the paper. There will certainly be a printer there printing out paper because we know that people do like to see it and it'll certainly be there. There will be screens, certainly. Colour, beautiful graphic output connected to Prestel, connected into their main computer. The one thing I'm not so sure about is whether we'll see, hopefully, people will find a replacement for that, which is the keyboard. And that's the real thing that needs the breakthrough. Inputting data with a keyboard is difficult, it's prone to errors, and it takes a lot of training to do it quickly. But whatever you say about keyboards as they are now, there's still always going to be a need for the manipulation of text. And is that the sort of job we can do on our microcomputer? Yes, it is. A lot of people think of um, computers as handling complex, difficult mathematical calculations. But in fact, a lot of the time, they are used for manipulating data, characters, words, and letters, and so yeah. on. And we can show you some of the instructions on here. You recognize that. Right? I'm beginning to recognize what looks like the beginning of a program. Yes, a computer program. Well, the first one is probably new to you. It's CLS, which is a very nice way of saying clear screen. And it means when you run the program, it just wipes out whatever's on the screen, so you start off with a very clear screen. And that's a bit of your standard basic that's right, yes. computer jargon. Well, I think I recognize the shape of the next one anyway. Print quotes, what is your word? That means that when you run the program, the first thing it'll do is print on the screen the words, what is your word, question mark. Right, Okay. Yes. And input word string is telling the computer to expect a word, a string of letters making up a right. word. Which in future you'll be able to refer to as word string and it knows where to find out what you right. put in. Okay. Now what we're going to do is to write a little instruction which tells you how many characters there are in the word that you put in. Uh -huh. So we can do that with the next instruction. All right. Let's it's print. Next. Print. Anyone, the famous instruction. Yes. In quotations. Yes. The length of your word is... Oops. Yes. Now, in, close, in, close the quotes. Right. Um, len, len word. Now, len is one of these abbreviations for length of word. And length will simply give us the length of, or the number of characters in your word. So we type length, but we don't type length. We type the abbreviation len. And len, and then the name that we've given it, which is 
word string. So it's len so. space word string. And that simply counts the number of letters in the word? In the word, yes. Yeah. So it's very simple. If you hit return, then run it. Oh, yes. right. Well, um... Arthur. That's a word. Right. Carriage return or return. Oh. The lengthy word is six, which is the number of characters in Arthur. One, two, three, four, That's five, six. Clever. Well, of course, you can't show a whole programme. We're showing little bits of instructions. That was a single instruction, if you like, which did that. But I have got a little programme here and a floppy. This is the yeah. little floppy the disk. floppy disk. Yes. Which we can put in here, close it up, yeah. and then we type load quotation marks text, which is the programme we've got on the floppy. Yeah. Can you turn? And there it is reading, yes. and it's already in. <laughs> so, now what we're going to show you, if you run it, mm. type run, and you'll see some text coming up now. There's right. the text. And you can see at the end here, it's all higgledy-piggledy. They're not lined Oh, it's as if, as if you typed it on a typewriter yes. and the left-hand margin is straight and the right-hand margin is always all crooked and indented. Yes, well, it's okay. one of the jobs a sort of word processor would do, which would have to count these letters and then work out how to shorten them to make all these correct. This um, is actually the sort of job that a, an expert compositor in a, in a printing works would spend hours putting little slivers of metal in between the yes, metal type right. blocks to get it straight. Right. right. Now, we've written a programme here that does that and uh, we simply hit a key. Bing. There's it done. Well, it's obvious from what Max has been saying that the computer provides an immensely powerful means for handling communications, but so much so that, as I said at the very beginning of the programme, some people have problems change in our way of life. For instance, people, it's been said, will no longer go to offices to work. They'll work from home. Shopping and banking can be done from the comfort of your own terminal right next to your own armchair. There'll be no more letter post, no more newspapers, no more libraries. But how realistic are these predictions? Rex Malik. What you've just seen tempts me to say, welcome to the electronic global village. Indeed, I'm also tempted to say, welcome to the electronic global office. But first, a word of warning. The electronic global village is different, but it's not all different. Computers are additional. They don't supplant what came before. They extend rather than constrict. I doubt an end to books and paper. I do see their role changing. I doubt the paperless office. Uh, I observe that uh, paper is what people prefer to read. Show me an office that doesn't need paper, and you probably also show me an office that doesn't even really need people. Uh, if you'll excuse the pun, you foresee there the people-less office. I doubt that. I think that's an illusion. The truth is that we need the office or something similar. We need somewhere to fight, to argue, to discuss, to compete. That's the nature of the beast, and that's what offices are for. All that electronics do is extend the scope of the action. So you have problems with the office next door? Well, just wait. I can see you having similar problems in the 80s, but with offices in Tokyo, San Francisco, London, Melbourne. As I say, Welcome to the Electronic Village.